Motherboards are usually something that many of us either cheap out on or pick after our CPU selection. It's not to say they aren't important, it's more to draw attention to the fact that it's usually not front and center when you're putting together a build. And even after you've built your machine, you're much more likely to talk about the specs of your CPU or graphics card more than you would your RAM or motherboard, for example. However, despite the somewhat overlooked nature of motherboards, they are absolutely vital to your system's operation, and choosing a board with insufficient spec for your chip could lead to instability or throttling. It's not to say you're in danger of damaging your components, but you might not be getting the maximum performance out of your chip. So to help understand the issue and learn some more about motherboards, let's take a look and run some experiments on some hardware I've got and test with not only one CPU, but four. Alright, so let's discuss what we'll be doing to help give us an idea as to how exactly your motherboard can affect performance. To start, we're trying to create a system in which the only variable being changed is our motherboard. As such, with all our CPUs, we'll be using the same RAM, graphics card, and storage devices, along with putting on a nice little overclock on all our chips. TLDR, we threw power limits out the window and made sure our overclocks were stable on both platforms. What will affect performance then is the power delivery and how effective it is at feeding our chip stable power. Speaking of, we'll be testing four Intel Coffee Lake processors, ranging from four cores up to eight, and as such power requirements scale with core count, meaning we should expect the lower end chips to be almost indiscernible between the platforms as the VRMs haven't reached load. And that's shown pretty nicely through Cinebench R20. Looking at the scores between the platforms, you'll see that the i3-8350K was within margin of error between Z370 and Z390. However, jump up to the i5 and now it's a bit wider. The trend continues on with the 9700K, but is most notable with the 9900K. Now this can be explained most likely through power delivery improvements made with Z390, meaning our i9 is able to tap further into its power budget. Just for note, this Z390 board, which is an MSI Z390A Pro, includes an extra 3 VRMs bringing the count up to 9 from Z370's 6, meaning the chip is able to boost its clocks higher. This is what causes performance to vary between the two boards, despite both of them having compatibility with the same chips and using the same socket. If you're a fan of AMD, it works the same way, just with different specifications, and just with the AM4 socket instead of 1151. Generally speaking, you're able to tell what kind of power delivery is available on a board based on how many of these weird squared things you see on the board, which are called chokes and generally follow the trend of more equals better. However, there are some situations where that isn't necessarily the case. Tying this back into the specific boards we're testing today, the Z390 is able to allow our chip to outperform itself than on Z370 thanks to the extra chokes and circuitry that comes along with them. Power delivery is a very complicated subject and has a lot to do with the voltage drop and overall space you have to work with. You don't want to put your power circuitry out on the edge of the board as voltage drop would cause any sort of filtering going on on the power rails to become incredibly inefficient. This is why you'll see power circuitry generally wrapped around your socket, and on your graphics card you'd also be able to find chokes and the like surrounding your GDDR chiplets or even the actual substrate itself. It's pretty easy to spot and I'm sure you'd be able to pick it out on your own system. However, how does this affect performance in everyday use cases, as Cinebench isn't exactly an everyday application? Alright, so I only ran benchmarks on three games thanks to the amount of work it takes to swap out a CPU and motherboard. However, the trend we discovered earlier more or less stays true here. Starting off easy, CSGO was able to give our chips a warm up and once again we're seeing the i9 throttle on the Z370 board. Keep in mind I'm only showing the average FPS of the chips just to keep the graphs a little cleaner, but the trend is somewhat there on the i5, noticeable on the i7, and then outside the margin of error on the i9. Now when we're talking about frame rates this high, you're not going to notice 413 FPS versus 399, however the issue isn't the performance we're getting, it's the performance we're leaving on the table. I personally subscribe to the philosophy of, I paid for the whole chip so I'm going to use the whole chip, so those extra 13 frames are a nice additional piece of performance you can get by improving your motherboard choice. Black Ops Cold War, like in our previous test videos, stuttered like crazy on all our chips, 
but this game is kinda tricky as the performance profile we've been seeing is more or less not here, or if it is, it's within the margin of error. This just shows how you'll see an improvement in some games and not in others. It could also be game to game variants, as many parts of the game are randomized, such as particle effects and environmental events. Our last game is Ark Survival Evolved, and despite the four cores on the i3, it performed surprisingly well on all our chips. This probably had a lot to do with the setting being set to high instead of ultra, but our little performance trend is back, and for our i9, the upgrade and motherboard really allowed it to stretch its legs a bit further with the upgrade to power delivery. Now that we've run a couple games along with Cinebench R20, what conclusions can we draw about motherboards, and are they as important as I'm making them out to be? Well, to answer the last part, yes, motherboards are important, but they aren't as important as your CPU choice. Obviously, you shouldn't buy an AM4 motherboard for an LGA1200 chip, but you also don't need to spend $300 on a light-up gaming board. You're able to get by with much cheaper boards, and although in this case the Z390 is definitely a step up over the Z370, the system is still functional and you're still getting core i7 levels of performance on the cheaper and older board. Realistically speaking, you only need to start paying attention to what kind of motherboard you're buying once you start getting into more expensive chips that consume more power. If you match a technically compatible chip with a board that has insufficient power delivery, then you end up with what I showed you in this video, and it's overall just less performance on a processor you paid for. Thankfully, boards can protect themselves, meaning if you do mismatch components, they'll operate according to the lowest common denominator, meaning that you aren't in danger of damaging your components. It's overall a very complicated topic, and the only way to really understand the issue is to develop an understanding of the basics, which trust me, is a whole world in and of itself. It's a beyond interesting subject, and dives into electrical engineering pretty heavily if you're into that sort of thing. And it's a fun way to pass the time if you're as bored as a motherboard.